Hi folks, thanks so much for joining our Monday Mindshare. Uh, last week we covered about metabolic reset and how to upregulate our metabolism. This week we're going to look at some specific research that really talks about what's the nature of exercise and nutrition that amplifies the specific triggers that are causing the adaption of fitness through exercise. And maybe more importantly, what are those same factors that depending upon how we exercise and how we apply nutrition, can we actually trigger and amplify those same factors higher to support our health and well-being? I hope you'll find it interesting. There is some relationships between what we covered last week on Metabolic Reset and what we're covering this week as exercise as medicine and what are the exercises and nutrition that will really amplify those factors that drive that adaption of fitness the most and our health and well-being the most. So with that, let me share here some slideware and we'll get into the research that's sitting behind this. But as I said first, again, I want to really call out the Danes and all of their work that they have done over that past 20 plus years. And particularly, I've been following uh, Benta Pedersen and some of her work and research. You'll find that if you dig into this, and I'll make sure I put, again, the research links uh, below, uh, but you'll see her name come up a lot in this research of exercise as medicine. She's the head at the Center for Inflammation and Metabolism and really has been central thrust behind this understanding where the muscle itself, as much as we understand it as a structural organ and obviously giving rise to movement, uh, her work and her team's work really began to understand in the late 90s, early 2000s, that the muscle was responsible for signaling not just to itself, but the broader system, the, the broader systems of the body. And it was that signaling that was actually creating uh, the adaption of fitness and also was creating uh, adaptions in health and well-being. And this was interesting because it wasn't thought that the muscle itself was really so much a gland, but they and their work really identified the muscle truly is an endocrine gland where it is secreting a multiplicity of chemicals and proteins. And that signaling was what is causing change throughout the body in a positive way. Uh, they sometimes, or they, they refer to these signaling proteins uh, as cytokines and just think of them as that. They are proteins and all they do as they're released, in this case from the muscle, they signal to other cells around the body and the muscle itself. Uh, and as a result of that signaling, uh, other things happen. Now, this cytokine, uh, and particularly one that uh, Benter and their team looked at and found was interleukin-6. And this is probably best known for its role in the immune and the in inflammatory response. When we have an immune response or inflammatory response, interleukin-6 is best known for that. And it you know, does this through certain immune cells like macrophages and lymphocytes, et cetera. But um, it, it, it gets produced uh, in also from many other parts of the body. And one of the lesser well-known areas that it gets produced about is from visceral fat, which is the fat sitting around organs. And when, when that happens, it actually releases a more inflammatory response in the body, which is a negative aspect. But as it relates to exercise and contracting muscle and the muscle cells begin to release this interleukin-6, it is releasing that, uh, that signaling protein and it is as it interacts with various cells elsewhere around the body, and I'll show you this in a second, it's having extremely positive health-giving effects, both, as I said, to fitness adaption and also to uh, health and well-being. So let's dive into this and take a look more at just how this is happening. So on the left-hand side, this is fairly some of the more higher-level typical uh, chemicals and proteins that are that are being released or, or changes in these chemicals within the muscle cell. Think of lactic acid, which you're all no doubt familiar with, uh, a reduction in uh, muscle glycogen as it begins to be used 
or an increase in reactive oxygen species or free radicals. These things are sensed by the muscle and that sensation that is re realized by the muscle cell then uh, is what triggers, in a very simplistic term, uh, interleukin-6, this signaling protein uh, from the muscle cell. Now, the direct muscle cell can receive that interleukin-6 and respond as a muscle cell. It can grow in size. It can lay down more capillaries to bring more blood into the muscle as it signals these things like the lactic acid, the glycogen depletion, the reactive oxygen species, even the change in calcium ions. These things can be realized by the muscle and the muscle can release the interleukin-6 and the muscle can then be impacted by that interleukin-6 to grow as a muscle, to increase the vascularization uh, that can bring more oxygen or take more waste products away from the muscle, making it more ready for more physical activity or contractions in the future. Now, also that interleukin-6 can make its way out into the blood supply, of course, and systemically come through the body. And what this chart here is simply showing that from a metabolic perspective, because the muscle has realized there is a reduction or a change in uh, fuel or substrate availability, it's signaling out to the fatty tissue and to the liver to release fatty acids and also glucose back into the blood supply that ultimately come back to the muscle to feed the muscle to support this muscular contractions. So you can see here this role of interleukin-6 of having a really important function both at the muscle and also, and I'll show you soon some more charts on how systemic this interleukin-6 is having around the body. Now at S-Fuels for years, we've talked about the critical role of, you know, exercising at the start of our workouts without taking in glucose so that we can really trigger the GLUT4 transporter, which is inside of the muscle cell, and it has to move to the outside, to the cell edge, and open up the channel in the muscle cell to let the glucose come in. Well, we, we do this, but what's interesting to find out that it's interleukin-6 also, that when the muscles contract, it's interleukin-6 that triggers uh, that GLUT4 to start making that movement to the cell edge um, as much as things like calcium ions, reactive oxygen, these things are triggering that GLUT4 to move the cell edge, open up the channel, allow the glucose to come in. And doing that without taking in glucose, we know that we can also maintain maximal lipolysis, the breakdown of fatty, uh, fatty, acid, fat, fatty tissues and have them also come into the muscle cell for oxidation and energy release. Well, you can see the role of interleukin-6 having in this. So how big of an impact or how big of a secretion, if you will, is it? Well, this is some of the early studies that Benter and her teams were working on. And this was a really interesting study. Um, as I said, one of the earlier ones, they actually looked at a single exercising leg, meaning one leg was at rest and one leg was exercising. And you can see the x-axis here is time on these three charts. And it's quite sometimes five hours of exercising a single leg. Um, but what this is looking on the left-hand side is measuring interleukin-6 in the artery. So in the blood supply, if you will, already. So how much is already there flowing around the blood supply over this period of time? And then it looked at specifically on the leg itself that was exercising in the middle chart. And that is the little black boxes on the on the line chart is the exercising leg. And then the white little boxes uh, on the on the chart in the middle there, that is the resting leg. So you'll see here that after a period of time, you begin to see this rise in the uh, amount of interleukin-6 being uh, secreted on that exercising leg. And if you actually take, you know, the, the left-hand chart and the middle chart together and you kind of net out how much um, interleukin-6 is being released, um, and this is aside from what was already in the arteries, you can see that really the resting leg was next to nothing was being produced, yet quite significant amounts 
was being released in the exercising leg. And if you were to contrast this to the way interleukin-6 would be released in an immune response to a severe infection is very similar levels. Like it's that quite acute, dramatic release of interleukin-6 to have this effect. Now, why am I bringing all this up? Because it's this interleukin-6 that is triggering all these adaptions that happen in the body, both as it relates to fitness and also to well-being. And what I want to get to in this uh, video is to talk about, well, what is the nature of exercise and nutrition approaches that we can tune in our protocols of training to maximize this interleukin-6 response out of the muscle so that we can have maximal adaption and therefore most effective training and most effective nutrition uh, to our fitness and also our well-being. So as I said, interleukin-6 is not just affecting aspects that improve uh, fitness levels, like uh, promoting more vascularization. If I look in the top left of this chart, it's showing you know, how interleukin-6 will promote the increase in the amount of the capillary beds uh, around the muscle cell, bringing more oxygen into muscles, being able to take waste products out of the muscle. Um, but you can see as you go around this chart, improving uh, the skin, improving uh, BDNF, brain-derived nootropic factor, and uh, reducing appetite, reducing the visceral uh, fatty mass. So this is the fat around the visceral organs I, I mentioned earlier that produces in, infl inflammatory uh, interleukin-6. It actually reduces that amount of fat. It helps to break down uh, fatty tissue, lipolysis. It helps to, when you look at the cells involved with inflammation, like macrophages, it reduces some of the uh, other proteins that signal uh, those uh, inflammatory cells like tumor necrosis, necrosis factor, it reduces that. It increases other anti-inflammatory uh, interleukins like interleukin 10. So there's just many effects that this um, uh, hormone, if you will, this protein, as it gets released out of the muscle and makes its way into the blood supply is having many effects on improving our fitness, but it is also having many effects around the body in a positive way uh, to uh, be health giving in a sense. So with that as a base, let's talk about some of the uh, research findings on how you maximize uh, in training and nutrition uh, to support, uh, if you will, maximal release of this myokine interleukin-6. So let's just first talk about um, aspects as it relates to training and workouts. Duration. Duration is the prime determinant factor that will elevate interleukin-6. So think aerobic long, slow distance as the type of exercise that will maximally cause that secretion, that release of interleukin-6. And some of the studies, and again, I'll put the links down below, talk about that when they looked at, you know, short run training or workouts, think sub, you know, one hour, you might see maximally uh, up to 10 times increase in interleukin-6. Well, that sounds good, and it is good. <laughs> um, but just to give you contrast, when they looked at measuring interleukin-6 after a 250 there about kilometer ultra marathon, just to give contrast here, is they found interleukin-6 had risen 8,000 times. Now, <clears throat> there's I'm, I'm giving you here the extremes, but just to give context. So what this means, though, is as we do our zone two aerobic long, slow distance sessions, on the weekends, usually for a lot of age group athletes where they have the time to do this, it's going to be those three hour, four hour sessions that is going to be most potent to really stimulate interleukin six. Well, okay, but we don't always have three hours every day, unlike professional athletes, which obviously do. 
Um, but what about intensity? And it is true that by raising intensity, we can further amplify uh, the muscle secretion of interleukin-6. And what they showed was, is that actually, if you were to do a uh, 30-minute uh, exercise, which is obviously short, like what we just talked about, but you were to do that at 50% uh, duration, there was very little to no increase in uh, interleukin-6. So think of just having a, a short walk. Well, not a lot of benefit. Um, it's interesting to note that if they had continued that intensity of 50%, and but they did it for hours, there would be an increase in interleukin-6. So the key message here is that when you have the shorter sessions during the week, think of one hour, one and a half hour. If you can, in the midst of those, insert uh, some high intensity threshold interval type work, that will absolutely have a promotion effect of uh, interleukin-6 secretion. Well, then they looked at different exercise types and what they found, and it was just um, one uh, or a couple of studies that looked at running versus cycling. And certainly it would seem that running had a more pronounced uh, secretion or triggering effect of the secretion of interleukin-6. So um, long, slow distance, most potent way to increase interleukin-6 uh, production and secretion. It can be intensified or further amplified by some threshold high intensity work. Running has a greater effect than cycling. Um, let's now talk about then the nutritional aspects that further elevate interleukin-6 secretion. Now, one of the reasons, remember, that interleukin-6 is being produced in the first case is because the muscle is sensing that there is a reduction in the fuel availability or the substrate availability in the muscle. And that glycogen depleted state, and we talked about this in our metabolic reset session last week, that, that glycogen depleted state is helping to trigger the interleukin-6 response. So think about like we talk um, generally of going into the morning workout in a fasted state, um, it, that will facilitate a more pronounced uh, secretion of interleukin-6 as opposed to going into workouts, you know, having taken in carbohydrate. And we know some of the work that Dan has done in his labs with his students have absolutely shown this, that if you begin a workout with carbohydrate, you absolutely see a decline in fat oxidation uh, and again, remember, like we said, interleukin-6 is causing that breakdown lipolysis of fatty tissue. It's also increasing fatty uh, acid oxidation. Dan also showed that, hey, taking some protein and fat doesn't seem to have as, uh, as much of an effect on blunting fatty acid oxidation. So we can still go into these workouts in without taking in carbohydrate and a glycogen depleted state, but we can still feel satisfied if we were to take in some fat slash protein. We talk about an S-Fuels Life Bar, which is exactly designed for that as a great way to feel satisfied. I go into the workout with vibrance and energy to take it on, but at the same time, still effectively a glycogen depleted state. The second nutritional element is that of caffeine. We talk a lot about that. We talked about it in the metabolic reset uh, last week and the template we gave there for the metabolic reset. And we showed the relevance of caffeine uh, and how it uh, up, up regulates um, uh, the, met the metabolism. And furthermore, we've seen in studies that suggest that caffeine taken with exercise can double uh, the release of interleukin-6 in some of those studies, the before and after. So uh, again, it applies here that as we increase the caffeine and more interleukin-6 is released, the greater the adaption of our exercise. So like using our primed before the workout. And lastly, the other nutritional component 
uh, which is, as you know, part of our training and racing products is glutamine. And you'll see that in some of those studies that with exercise, they saw this 11 times rise in interleukin-6. If the exercise was done with glutamine, there was an 18 times rise uh, in interleukin-6. So um, in a practical then application, if I can show this chart, which is similar to what we have been, you know, have, we, we do have in our usage guide, um, the key things here is that in our training, clearly both aerobic, long, slow distance, zone two type work is most critical uh, in this top left here, uh, most critical to really trigger uh, interleukin-6 response and help that drive the adaption of uh, fitness uh, in the body. Now, uh, separate to that, and in addition to that, if you will, is the importance of higher intensity training sessions. And, you know, whether it's all of the work that Dan does in Endure IQ and the different workouts you'll see, but you'll commonly see in his workout threads, not just the adoption of, you know, if you will, threshold sessions, but even in aerobic sessions, you'll see that Dan has commonly a period of high intensity uh, intervals, if you will, during that broader, long, slow distance session. And part of that is to deplete some of that glycogen and really trigger this adaptive effect. So it's very well put together uh, by the Endure IQ team. But you'll see that, of course, in other training you know, methods, whether it's the Norwegian methods where they talked about multiple threshold days. Uh, this is very much about stimulating low glycogen uh, muscle states and in those states really triggering mostly or more more, more pronounced way uh, an adaption uh, to fitness. So on the right-hand side here, you can see just, again, how our prime product is working with the caffeine and carnitine on really improving the breakdown of fatty uh, fatty tissue, um, both how ca caffeine and carnitine is working also on the transport and also the oxidation of it. Uh, and, you know, as we look more and more into the study on how these nutri nutrients are working in the body, we see again now interleukin-6 being promoted by that caffeine and taking it in prior to the training workout. Now, during the training workout, again, in trying to exacerbate and pronounce further the aerobic ad ad uh, adaptions, interleukin-6 can be heightened because of the glutamine that is found in our train product, our first generation train product. And we're doing a lot of work on second generation developments that will come out soon. And to further really emphasize this effect on the train product, training the metabolism to, if you will, be upregulated to embrace the aerobic adaptions of, of exercise of our workouts. So folks, I hope you found that interesting. It's uh, really fascinating science to just how this training adaption actually happens and what is the signaling molecules, in this case, interleukin-6, that is really helping to drive that change. And furthermore, not just for fitness adaptions, maybe more importantly, our well-being and health. And I hope you apply this into your routines, both the nutrition and also some refinements there to your training to really get maximal effect in your workouts and all the effort that you put into it. Thanks again very much for joining again. We look forward to catching up next week where we're gonna talk more about lactic acid and how we can optimize our training and our nutrition to support the effect uh, in the body. All the best for this week and as usual, stay well.